Uh, before I read case, <laughs> a few quick thank yous, uh, because I guess that's what you do. Um, first, to our coaches, without whom I wouldn't even know the world of public forum has brought me so much. Uh, Mr. Dolan and um, Harrison, thank you guys. Uh, even though you give you guys yourselves gray hairs stressing over us, it means a lot. Uh, second, is our circuit, our debate friends and adopted family. Uh, we come from a small school, so we usually don't see a lot of people on the circuit that we know. But um, it means everything, uh, Sophia and Sharon from Cyprus, and um, Shabin Falafels, Maggie and Sasha, have adopted us as one of their own. And of course, our Central Florida squad, how could we forget about them? Uh, Trinity, Katie, and my sister Alexis, you guys are so nice to us. And the entire Lake Highland squad, there's too many of you guys to name, so uh, I don't want to forget any of you. Uh, and by the extension to Vesh, even though he hides all this prep in like folders, that we can find. Um, third, and finally, uh, my family, mom and dad, uh, they did everything to bring me to where I am today, and even though it cost them a lot of money, they still send me all over the world, and all over the country. So, with that, is everybody ready? Oh, of course. How could I forget? My partner, Alfie. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, he's um, like a brother to me, so even though I forgot him, uh, <laughs> it's a good guy. Uh, we fight, but it's okay. All right, enough said. Everyone's good? Right. Albie and I have firm resolve the United States federal government should prioritize reducing the federal debt over promoting economic growth. Our sole contention is preventing the looming debt crisis. Right now, according to CBO in 2018, the national debt is 96% of GDP while the debt itself increases by hundreds of billions of dollars every single year. The Trump plan for economic growth threatens to accelerate this process by adding $6 trillion to our already existing $12 trillion debt. Policymakers and economists shield themselves behind economic growth and trust the dollar will remain strong forever so we can continue to borrow indefinitely. But just last month, Winkler of Bloomberg explains that for the first time in history, the market has pressed, priced U.S. Treasury bonds as more risky than China's bonds. People are beginning to lose faith in our broken system, making a debt carry real and severe consequences. Specifically, the debt crisis carries three dangerous implications. The first is crowding out private investment. Overseas investors trust U.S. bonds less and less. As a result, Kruger of the Wall Street Journal found in 2018 that foreign buyers only hold 41% of U.S. bonds, the U.S. debt, their lowest share in 15 years. American investors have increasingly purchased U.S. bonds to finance their debts rather than investing in stocks and other productive economic investments. This is why Rubens of the Brookings Institute in 2004 quantifies the effect. An increase in the budget deficit of $100 reduces domestic investment by $50. This economic effect is very real. Bosia of the Heritage Foundation in 2013 explains that crowding out investment net harms GDP and stops private investment in programs that boost people's standard of living. In 20 years on this trajectory, GDP is set to lower by 25%. Overall, Bigsby of the Brookings Institute in 2015 argues that keeping the debt from rising could boost per capita income by $6,000. Second is budget cuts. As a result of higher amounts of debt and more skepticism from borrowers, Rogan of the Washington Examiner in 2017 notes that interest payments on debt are set to double in the next five years, amounting to hundreds of billions of more dollars. This forces the government to pay off monthly interest rates rather than performing other basic functions because payments are mandatory spending items paid before anything else. This is why Schwartz of New York Times in 2018 contextualizes, within a decade, our interest payments will be $900 billion, outpacing any other spending program, including the military, Medicare, and our social security. This is awful, since spending programs are pivotal for poverty alleviation efforts. Casper Kevick of The Guardian quantifies in 2014 that without food stamps, 8 million Americans would live in poverty, and without social security, the, the poverty rate for older Americans would be above 53%. Third is a financial crisis. Normally, the government runs low deficits while the economy is booming, so when the eventual fall happens as part of the natural business cycle, it is easy to bounce back with government spending. However, running a high deficit during growth periods means we cannot bounce back, increasing the severity of a recession. Irwin of New York Times in 2018 argues that deficits create the very vulnerability in the government that fueled the 2008 global financial crisis and the 2010 Eurozone crisis. For both of these reasons, Hall of the National Bureau of Economic Research quantifies in 2013. High debt to GDP ratio makes it 63% more likely you remain in a recession, but low debt to GDP ratio makes it 71% more likely you bounce out of a recession. This is why Bernstein of Washington Post contextualizes in 2018. Without fiscal space, the fall in GDP during the recession is over five times as severe. Without prioritizing debt, recessions both last longer and are more severe. This has ramifications domestically and abroad. 
The Brookings Institute in 2010 found in just one year of recession, the number of people below the poverty line increased by 4.9 million. Even worse, Karshenas of the United Nations Officer for Developing Countries in 2009 explained that the global financial crisis impacted developing countries by restricting trade, worker remittances, and forms of aid. As a result, even conservative estimates predict that financial crisis puts 9.5 million people in the most extreme forms of poverty in the least developed countries. For all of these reasons, we are proud to have for helping me get to this point. I would also like to thank Josh for being a decent partner and the PS squad who put up with us for the weekend. Lastly, I would like to thank Charlie for my emotional support. He is the best dog I ever could have asked. <laughs> should not prioritize reducing the federal debt over promoting economic growth. Contention one is slow growth. Our stance is not that reducing the federal debt is a bad thing, but it is not what ought to be prioritized in the status quo. In recent weeks, markets have come to a sharp decline in the final months of 2018, resulting in a new era of slow economic growth and increased domestic focus on the economy that ought to be preserved. Yo, of London Business School in 2018 explains economic growth rates are weaker than before 2008 financial crisis. The U.S. has experienced a slowdown in productivity growth since the mid-2000s. Growth in advanced economies has permanently slowed, which suppresses investment and the economic outlook. U.S. labor force growth has slowed to just 0.2%, down from 2.1%. It is within our control to invest better. And absent this increased focus, slow economic growth poses a serious threat to the entire United States. Slow growth reduces our country's ability to combat poverty and improve the quality of life for the average citizen. Therefore, unless economic growth comes before debt reduction, we are essentially dooming millions of Americans into poverty. That's the Department for International Development. Economic growth is the most powerful instrument for reducing poverty and improving the quality of life. Studies provide overwhelming evidence that rapid growth is critical to making faster progress towards development goals. Growth can generate circles of prosperity and opportunity, and strong economic growth advances human development, which promotes economic growth. A, success, a successful strategy of poverty reduction must have its core measures to promote rapid and sustained economic growth. And domestic poverty is America's top cause of death and must be the largest impact in this debate. Clark of Soapbox reports in 2018, 4.5% of all deaths in the United States are caused by poverty-related deficiencies. Deaths surpassed 874,000 people from poverty-related issues this year. Closing the socioeconomic gap would have prevented about 60,000 premature the death rate among those is about 2.6% higher. Even if you don't buy poverty is the biggest impact in this debate, rapid economic growth is also to cause a whole litany of other problems, including disease, food shortages, pollution, and U.S. military readiness. Ferreira of the Heartland Institute in 2014 claims economic growth has produced dramatic improvements in personal health. We have virtually eliminated the scourge of diseases that have killed billions throughout history. That economic growth has made possible. Also, greatly contributing to the well-being of working people and the declining cost of food resulting from economic growth in agriculture. Moreover, economic growth has provided the resources, enabling us to dramatically reduce pollution and improve the environment. Only economic growth could achieve these results. Achieving and sustaining economic growth should be the central focus of national economic policy, for it would say solve every problem that plagues and threatens us today. Contention two is political instability. Even if they win that reducing the federal debt is a good idea, it is impossible without the prioritization of economic growth beforehand. As slow growth persists, interest rates begin to skyrocket, making their app impossible. Longer periods of slow growth means that payments on the national debt will become three times as high, continuing to cripple the economy while making debt recovery impossible in the first place. Weingarten, a PRI in 2017 reports, our economy has been growing unnecessarily slow. Today's stagnant economy has the same causes as yesterday's periods of slow growth, bad government policies. The current size of the government spending has become an obstacle to economic growth. If anything becomes worse, payments on the national debt will triple, <coughs> costing around a half trillion dollars in additional interest payments annually. And the only way that the app can reduce the debt is through austerity cuts, which puts the economy in a greater tails tailspin and causes political instability, which makes all their contentions inevitable and means we're the only ones that can solve. 
University of Pennsylvania in 2015 claims austerity is generally considered necessary when governments with large public debts and deficits have no choice. Austerity measures have made it worse for the country. It's rare that such policies will make the economy grow faster. It does not make sense when an economy is already in a tailspin and it should be put on hold until the economy is self-sustained. So one specific investment that we talked about is how economic growth in general would create more industry and that would create more job sectors what in industry? order to give people. Sure. So uh, we haven't outlined specific industries that would be created because that's not our burden. Our burden okay. is to prove that we'd be able to resolve so the impact of poverty agree? through developing Can we industry. agree the way you're going to promote economic growth is just through investment? Uh, there would be other measures that are you evidence okay, talks so about. Can you tell me the other measures? Sure. Other measures include development of certain technologies that would help industries not only grow in size, okay. but also so, grow in productivity. So let me get this straight. So your argument for promoting economic growth is one, somehow creating more investment. You don't. Uh, no, growth. that's but how. Secondly, you making, asked me how secondly, the argument for why we secondly, would do it is to resolve wait, wait, wait. poverty. Secondly, making new technology. No, that. You asked me why we would, how and why and how. That's what I answered. Just, the reason why know, we would wait, do it wait, wait, is because okay. of reducing poverty. I just, wanna, you a question. Wait, I just wanna know what your warrant is. Well, we are halfway through the process and I haven't asked you a question yet, so I'm gonna ask question. one. How does decreasing question. debt resolve the perception of US okay. bonds among the general public? How does it, like, what's the perception of the general public? Yeah, all of yours in yeah, the context yeah, sure, of how people sure. perceive US. So our entire argument is that the more debt we acquire, the less our currency is like competitive against other currencies, right? The value of a currency is based on what assets yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm not explaining the effect I'm of finishing, the I'm finishing my answer. Okay. It's based on the assets that we've invested in. If a currency holds a massive amount of debt, investors don't think that you can pay off that debt, which is why the value of the dollar is priced riskier than China's yuan right now. Okay. That's the competitive advantage that the UN has because they don't hold so much debt. I want to clarify. I, I wasn't asking the effect of a change of perception. I was asking how would de economic growth resolve that perception? I, you would say economic growth the, resolves yeah, that. Or I don't how agree. Would, sorry, how would debt reduction resolve that? How would, debt re how would debt reduction? If we have less debt, it's more likely we can pay off that debt in the future. Our interest rates don't balloon so far out of control <laughs> that it takes up one third of our government spending 10 years from now. That's our argument on your case. Okay. You say that our like, economic growth is weaker than 2008 right now. Yeah. Are you saying our current economy is worse than 2008? Uh, it's not that it's worse than 2008. So what, what we're talking about is that? that the slow growth that is currently taking place is less than the bounce back. We're after at 4% growth right now. No, How it's is the lowest slower? percentage that we've ever been since the recovery of 2008. Not since 2008. Okay, so let me get this straight. On net, we've been going up since 2008. No. We have gone down. So what is your argument? Post 2008, we were at a high point. So, so after, the after 2008, we've been since 2008, we are at the lowest point that we've ever so, been, and that's so why we need fast growth right so now. So your argument is since 2008, our economy has only gotten worse. Post recovery from 2008, not 2008. Can mm -hmm. we see that? Yeah. yeah. Okay.
as well. I have some thank yous. Um, first, to my parents. They're, they're, they never really come to debate tournaments because they're really busy people, but I can always count on them to be following me like obsessively on things like Speechwire and Tabroom and texting me after every single round. And it really means a lot to me that they support them, that they support me in debate, especially since there are a lot of institutional barriers like about costs that prevents us from accessing this activity. They work extra hard so I can be able to do this. So I really love them for that. Secondly, I guess I'll thank Andrew. I mean, I would love to get you in my speech, but you're honestly like a brother to me too. Everyone at school calls us the old married couple because we're always bickering, not about each other, but about debate arguments. So this activity's really brought us closer together, and I'm really grateful for that. With that said, is everyone ready? Okay. The fundamental premise to their entire case is that we are at the slowest rate of economic growth since the 2008 recovery. We called for this evidence, and it is terrible. First of all, it's not about the United States. It's about other advanced economies. Second of all, it's outdated. It's from June in 2018, where we read you evidence from Kimberly Amadeo of The Balance, who finds in January 1st of this year that our 2019 economic output has sustained growth rates between 2 and 3%, some of the highest growth rates that we have ever seen in our economy. We are at unemployment is at its natural rate. Our economy, if you've been keeping up with the news, has, do, has done nothing but grow and grow and grow. That's why their evidence is so controversial, because it's so bad and it's not true. This already takes out their entire case, because we shouldn't prioritize economic growth if that's already what's happening right now, you should prioritize the threat to economic growth, which is the looming debt crisis and ever-increasing debt-to-GDP ratio. Clearly, economic growth is not sufficient enough to solve back for the debt. But let's get into the nitty-gritty of their first contention, where they basically say how economic growth is the most powerful thing to reduce poverty. They say in Crossfire that the main way they do this is with things like investment. But our entire case outweighs this and controls for investment. Remember what we talked about the private crowding out effect. Less people invest in private institutions in our economy when we run high budget deficits because now they're looking at safer investments like U.S. Treasury bonds. This takes away from domestic investment. We even quantify for you every $100 increase in the budget deficit for Reduces domestic investment by $50. We are the main driver of this productive economic growth. But most importantly, this argument is about theoretical economic growth being a very good thing. This isn't the debate world to talk about the theoretic economic growth. You need to prioritize this resolution in the context of the current United States and how we grow our economy, and these policies are terrible. Specifically, if you look at the way the current administration has grown our economy, it's through things like tax cuts. This is terrible for long-term sustainable economic growth and also low-income individuals. Ken Kersley finds in 2018 that by cutting taxes on the wealthy, you increase income inequality because now all the poor people really have to have the same amount of taxes, the rich just keep getting richer. This is terrible for low-income individuals because now the cost of goods continue to increase and they aren't able to afford it, which is why Lopez of the, of, of the National Economic Bureau finds every 1% increase in income inequality increases the poverty rate by 5.2%. This argument is already happening right now because DaCosta of the Costrin Library explains that already since Trump has taken office and in, in, instituted his economic growth policy, the average CEO is 312 times more, has, has seen their wage increase 312 times more than their workers. Income inequality is terrible for low-income individuals, which we should argue should be prioritized since the wealthy always have a buffer, but low-income individuals are hurt the most. But secondly, they, to, they go on to say how economic growth solves for things like decreased pollution and decreased climate change. But this could not be farther from the truth if you look at the current administration's way of growing the economy again. Bailey of the Brookings Institute explains in 2018 that the Trump administration's way of growing the economy is deregulation. They deregulate oil companies and they don't even believe that climate change is a real thing in the first place. They go on to just exacerbate their impact, especially when you look at since the Trump administration has occurred, we've seen carbon emissions increase by 2%. This is terrible. And this just perpetuates their, their impact about pollution being a really bad thing in the first place. Let's talk about their second intention where they talk about political instability. This isn't true at all. We have raised the debt ceilings 10 times in the past decade alone. Politics isn't preventing us from reducing the debt. And even if it was, that would be a reason for you to vote for us and prioritize actual debt reduction rather than just taking on more and more debt in the first place. The only way you reduce the debt is if you vote for us and prioritize it in the government's agenda in the first place. Then they go on to say how austerity is really, really bad because it will hurt the economy and it will just increase our debt in the future. But the problem with this is austerity is going to happen either way. The Congressional Budget Office explains the longer you wait and the more that interest payments accrue, we are going to have $900 billion to pay every month in terms of monthly interest. We won't be able to spend and we will be forced to enter austerity, which is why he says 3% cutting of GDP now versus 58% in the future. 
it'll be down there, Keith, then answering the responses directly. Mm -hmm. The affirmative does absolutely nothing in today's economic trends. First, their links are predicated on bonds. That is not something they can solve for. First, Pettinger of Oxford University writes in 2018 that high debt does not cause higher bond yields as they can be low during periods of high debt due to markets being key for bonds. That occurred in the UK in 2010, which means their impacts do not manifest in the status quo. Second, their evidence is in the context of general perception, which they cannot solve. Remember back to Miles' cross-section when they asked them, how do you change their perception? And they could not give an answer, which means all of their impacts are inevitable in the status quo. Next is the argument about crowding out. First, from North Carolina State University writes that there is no direct relationship that exists between the crowding effect and high debt, as high debt has also led to crowding in. Second, Foster of the Heritage Foundation explains in 2013 that the main problem with crowding out is that it assumes the U.S. economy effectively operates in isolation and can't borrow money from abroad. If they do that, the domestic markets are left largely unchanged since government and the private sector are no longer competing for the same money. Third, Weissman, states in 20, Weissman of Slate writes in 2018 that there is no evidence of the crowd out effect currently happening. With the amount of debt that we have, this should already be happening according to the affirmative. Next, turn. The Sybil of Wired finds in 2017 that when there is an abundant amount of capital, companies get an initial investment too easily and they become compl complacent. He further that this is empirically supported by the US versus the UK, where the UK does not have such ready access to capital and thus pushes the technology companies to be innovative. Next, they say they make an argument about prerequisites to growth, but do not give them these arguments. First, we turn this, because debt promotes economic well-being. Amadeo of Balance explains in 2018 that the federal debt allows the, gov the government to obtain extra funds to invest in economic growth by being attractive to risk-averse uh, risk investors. These investments then in turn approve the standard of living by allowing the government to build new roads and bridges, improve education and employment, provide pensions, increase consumer spending, which turns all of their arguments about cuts happening in the status quo. Next, onto their cuts argument. One, promoting economic growth means that we will not have to reduce spending at all. Lewis of Forbes in 2012 said that if we were to decrease our spending, it would just need to be to the point where spending is in line with revenue. As GDP grows through economic growth in the long term, we could spend more money in the budget, and as the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget finds in 2013, every dollar increase in GDP will produce 25 more cents in revenue, which means that economic growth is the net best strategy because it gives us the most money to prevent these cuts from happening in the status quo. Next, they say uh, that there will be a recession. However, debt is crucial for recovering from a recession. During periods of recession, governments promote economic growth by bailing out and buying up debt from businesses and households. For instance, during 2008, the federal government brought up distressed assets to prevent banks from defaulting. Leinder of the CBPP finds in 2015 that without these government interventions, the 08 recession would have lasted twice as long and unemployment would have been twice as high, leaving 17 million Americans unemployed. Indeed, COPA and Forbes corroborates in 2018 that when countries in Europe took this debt-oriented approach during financial crises, it led to a decades-long slump with unemployment in double digits. Second, Arnold of NPR writes that the central banks have distorted the bond market, which throws off the recession meter inevitably. On to our case. Their argument about why, this, why we are experiencing fast growth is not true. They only cite the example of economic outputs, but they can see multiple warrants that are new evidence that can indicate where we are low in other sectors. Our evidence bits say specifically, the U.S. has been experiencing a slowdown in productivity growth since the mid-2000s. They try to say that it's in the context of uh, other economies, we can call for the evidence. The first four lines that we read, the only lines we read, are specifically in the context of the United States economy. Next, they say that economic output is up, but they have also conceded there are other factors that can, that can, can determine the strength of an economy. For example, GDP, pro uh, productivity in the workplace. They have not answered this. Next, they say that case out is investment, but I've already advanced and answered their investment arguments on their case page. Make them prove an example of crowd out in the status quo before you grant them this argument. Next, they say tax cuts, but they have not given it out any reason or warrant as to why tax cuts will happen as a result of negating. There is no piece of evidence to reason why we need tax cuts. On our climate change argument, they said they only answered the pollution, but Ferrer says we can also solve for disease, food, and strength. They have also conceded our wine garden effort, which means this debate is over. Weingarten says that we are a prerequisite to reducing, uh, the reducing the interest rates, which means that any economic or any debt reduction that is possible has to come from economic growth first. Because unless, or without economic growth, they become three times higher and will default on our investment. Uh, yeah, sure.
You said that economic growth and GDP can solve back for the debt path. Uh, well, first of all, you conceded this argument, so it's imperative. No, true. I did not. Second of all, sorry. our Weingarten evidence states that with economic growth, we can lower interest rates. Yeah, how that? Well, I asked I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. Without in, without this economic growth, interest rates will triple, which will make the debt three times harder to pay back because it'll add 500 or 500 no, why dollars. Why does yeah. increasing GDP reduce the debt? Our Weingarten evidence indicates that it can lower interest rates, which makes paying back the debt why? easier. No, why? You're just because it lowers saying, interest. Rates. Why does it lower interest rates? Because if we have more money, then people are less likely to default on their debt, which means interest rates. Okay. Lower. Okay. So your argument is that people look at the United States and they say, "How's their GDP doing before they invest?" If right, this no, is the case, it refers to domestic investment. As well. You already conceded yes. this argument. No, I should not concede so this argument. We've been disagreeing with this argument from the beginning. We don't think that economic growth should be, prior should, should be prioritized over debt. Obviously, we're the affirmative. What we're saying is it's not a prerequisite because the way they're growing the economy is through tax cuts. Right, that means we don't have much tax revenue. Can I have a question? It's not conceded, Can I have a question? yes. Sure. sure. Yeah. What other factors are used to measure strength of the economy? So you said that productivity was the strength. We economy. isolated like multiple different factors. Yeah. You said just economic output. What other factors are used to measure the strength of an economy? Like you said, productivity is one of them. I would say the best one to look at how well our economy is growing is the economic growth rate. Sure. So what is our economic growth rate at now? Four percent. Okay. What piece of evidence do you have to substantiate that? The Amadeo evidence that I read in my rebuttal. Okay. How does that evaluate to uh, lower, or how does that compare to lower economic output in the labor force? Because economic output in the labor force is a factor in our growth. If our growth on net is increasing, this is the ultimate number that you should prefer. So growth is good. No, no, I'm not saying growth is good. I'm just saying we're growing right now. And the fundamental premise of your case is that our economy is slowing down, which is why we need to prioritize economic growth. If you've been keeping up with the news lately, we are seeing one of the biggest booms ever. I'm not sure how you can say the end of the United States. saw the lowest market value since 1930. That's why we read you evidence from January 2019. It's a not come back since 1933. Our economy is worse. We're worse than we were in the Great Depression. One example, it's not a constant decline. It's one example of a recent drop at the end of 2018. And we, Good first question. of all, we would say we are not in like worse state than we were in the Great Recession. Second of all, we read you evidence from January of 2019. Sure, do you have a question? Yeah, so you say that, like do you, wait, do you agree that the way the government grows the economy is important? Uh, sure, we have power, okay, we great. isolate a variety of different factors. Yes. You can hold up, pigeonhole us to one and I'm not listening to the multiple other I, pieces of things. So that you which one do you think you should prefer? The most probable way the government's been doing this? What do you mean? So, uh, opposed to? So, so you should oppose to, like, let's look at the way they are actually growing the economy rather than some theoretical way that they should prioritize. Our view evidence outlines actual things that are happening in the status quo, not theoretical measures, i.e. innovation in the workplace. Yes, but Trump is doing that by cutting taxes on the wealthy, cutting the corporate tax, and hoping it trickles down Trump to Trump is not cutting taxes on the wealthy. That is his entire policy. And if you need a piece of evidence to substantiate that, we have Trump lots of it. Yeah. So, for the judges, um, I'm going to start on economic growth, like their case, first contention, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Let's 
start on their first contention. Their entire contention is contingent on the idea that economic growth is slowing down right now since 2008. That's not true at all. We're at all-time high rates of economic growth at up to 4% with the Trump administration. The problem with their argument is that they're not looking to the real world. If you look at how tax cuts or deregulation and like the economic growth is going to be prioritized in the real world under the current administration, it's going to be because of tax cuts. The current Trump administration has already done this, created tax cuts and created deregulation. What has this done? Ten Kersley tells you this has only increased inequality because it only benefits the wealthy with the tax cuts, not actually helping the poor. And the Lopez card tells you the more you increase inequality, the more you increase poverty because poorer people cannot afford the same goods that the wealthy people can. The cost tells you this has actually empirically happened right now. The, the wages of CEOs have increased by 312 times, but the wages of those in the most poor areas have not have stayed stagnant and exactly the same. But secondly, they extend this Weingart evidence and they say economic growth is going to solve back for the debt. That's not true at all. The evidence says that interest rates are going to triple in the next couple of years. That's how we're going to solve their argument. But go to our case. We say, they say that the perception of the US dollar is never going to change. This isn't true. The Harvard International Review tells you that the yuan is actually becoming a very close competitor to the US dollar. The reason why this is true is because the value of a currency is based on what kind of assets the currency is invested in. If the currency is invested in a vast amount of debt, then other currencies are likely to outtake it because investors don't believe you're going to pay off this debt in the future. That's the second response. If we don't deal with their debt now, this has two implications. A, I will tell you that if you increase the total volume of debt, you also have to pay interest rates to more investors, which means you're losing money there. But secondly, and more importantly, if you scare the investors because you have such a large amount of debt and you might default, they also increase their interest rates. Which is why Rogan card tells you interest payments are going to double the next five years on our budget cards argument, and Schwartz tells you it's going to be $900 billion more than any other program. This is problematic, because we tell you, Casper Kevy explains, if the interest rate doubles, we don't have any fiscal space, and 8 million people are going to be put in poverty because we cannot afford food stamps and um, the social security nets are going to be destroyed. But secondly, and more importantly, the recession card tells you that the high debt GDP ratio makes you more likely to be in a recession, but 71% more likely to escape out of a recession when the government has money to spend. Please vote out. All right, uh, starting a few minutes. First on our case, they say econ growth has increased, but you outlines a slow in productivity and a decline in job growth and wage growth. There's no indication that we're ever going to get to an agreement, but you should call for the evidence at the end of the round because you is very clear that our economy is at the lowest point since recovery from 2008. Now, they can see that the DID evidence which answer their solvency arguments because it says that the only way to resolve economic growth, or the only way to resolve poverty is through economic growth. There were four warrants. First was that it increases wages. Second was that it allows more people to have jobs, which increases their monetary funds. Third was that it increases innovation and industry productivity, which means it's a 
prerequisite to creating any funds in the first place. Now, their interest rate triple argument is a negative argument because this is why we need econ growth in the first place because they have conceded that econ growth is key to uh, decrease rates because it gives more money so that people no longer default, which would encourage people loaning to decrease their debts because they trust that borrowers will pay them back. This is substantiated by our wine garden evidence that says that growth can resolve debt by creating money to pay back investors. By creating money to pay back investors, we are able to increase more productivity, which means that the only way, even if they win all their case, the only way to resolve debt in the first place is by creating growth, which means you should vote negative. Now, on their case, first extend the, uh, the Trom evidence that talks about how there's no relationship between crowding out and high debt, which means that they don't resolve it even if they decrease the debt, they don't change anything about crowding out. But you should also drop the turn that the debt promotes economic well-being. Amadeo, the balance explains in 2018 that federal debt allows the government to obtain extra funds to invest in economic growth by being attractive to risk-averse investors, which means that we incre increase output as a result of higher debt, which means it's a good thing. <coughs> they also conceded that promoting economic growth means we will not have to reduce spending as much or at all. The Lewis evidence from Forbes explains that if we were to decrease our spending, it would just need to be to a point where spending is in line with revenue, which means that the spending cuts that they're talking about aren't to the, uh, to the level that they discussed. Lastly, debt is crucial for recovery from a recession, which is the Reingard cost application. Even if they win their case, we have won a prerequisite argument. Okay, okay. ready? Uh, wait, can I sit down real quick? prioritizing the economy okay so this is what we're talking about it's, it's like it doesn't matter that. whether trump is prioritizing the economy you haven't proven anything about policies that are going to get passed that check back he's, against already, he's, already, he's already passed policies you like haven't that. outlined a single policy yeah, that trump has passed that checks back against slow growth. he's already already okay. he's already cut taxes what do you how, mean how, how does that resolve slow growth? growth wait but this is important right trump is the one who's prioritizing the economy you would say trump has been trying to grow it right we this isn't a question. Slow growth is all that is growth. Do you think that Trump is prioritizing the economy? Okay. Like, yes or no? Okay. And the reason you haven't allowed me to answer it, you're just giving a speech in no. process. No. No. Can we, can we, you're literally just speaking. Can we agree that the current administration is like prioritizing okay. economic growth over the Okay, best? I'm going to answer that now. Okay. Even if Trump is prioritizing that, there has not been a policy in place to check slow growth. Our you yes, evidence outlines that the problem to. is not a differentiation between okay. growth no, and the. No, I can't answer you yeah, if you okay. don't. Okay. <laughs> Our you evidence outlines that it's not about a discrepancy between growth and decline. It's a discrepancy between high growth and slow growth. Slow right. growth is the status quo, and that's such a right. So, the, but the point is that like the current administration has already prioritized growth, right? And we would disagree. But can we okay. ask you a yeah, question? Now? Wait, wait, wait. How is that? Okay, what's the most likely way the current administration okay. continues? We're going to ask you a question now because it's halfway through. I'm, ask, I'm asking. If interest rates are already at nine hundred, I'm in the minute. majority of the time. I'm in the middle of asking a question. Use a minute. So, what's the, the, what's the most likely the way? What's the most likely way the current administration continues to prioritize growth? Uh, they they only would if we prioritize economic growth. I'm going to ask a question okay. now. It's okay. been a minute and a half, and we haven't asked one. Okay. If interest rates are already at $900 million, how is your case recover from those fees? Wait, no. We're saying our interest rates are set to double, which is why we should reduce the debt. Because the debt is what's the, the high amount of debt no. is what's causing high interest rates. The sure. only reason the interest rates continue to go up is if we have a risk of defaulting because we don't deal with our debt. The more scary the debt is, the more interest rate goes up. If we deal with our debt now, it's better than waiting 10 years and saying, oh, maybe we'll have to deal with it later. So if that's not to that, how would more money being produced increase the amount of default that If we cut into the debt now, it's easier to deal with than later. That's just our argument. Okay. It's very sure. simple. Our argument is if you allow interest rates to continue to hike, it overtakes the entire budget. You said they can cut things like waste, but our argument is that the longer you wait, the more and more they have to cut, which just beyond waste, they start eating up into the federal budget, which we both agree is what grows the economy. That's where we're doing the long-term way. But can we ask you a question? Yes. Okay, so on this idea of Trump growing the economy, he's been prioritizing economic growth. What has the debt-to-GDP ratio been doing? Okay, the debt-to-GDP ratio we've outlined it has fluctuated throughout wait, wait, wait. history. What, what is it but at we've right also now? Outlined I'm asking what is it right now. What is it at right now? Okay, like, I'm sure you have a specific it's statistic about Thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's projected, projected to skyrocket. We've been doing that since case. <laughs> the reason why it's important is because we're showing you Trump is prioritizing the economy. If really economic growth could solve back for debt, then the debt to GDP ratio would not be overtaking oh, an amazing increasing. question. <laughs> Here's two seconds that we're starting now. It's going to be very important.
good? Okay. The first place you vote for us is off of current economic growth policies being a terrible thing. They keep saying that growth is being slowed with their U evidence, but the part of the U evidence that says that there are two different growth rates does with deals with other advanced economies. That's not the United States. That's the indict that we read against their evidence. But secondly, more importantly, it's outdated. Even if somehow you were able to believe that our economy was growing in 2018, as of 2019, we're saying that growth is at an all-time high, as it was before in 2018. If you've been following the news, that's what's happening. It doesn't matter if you look at all these other micro factors. The growth rate is the most important, and the growth rate is increasing. That's why there's economic growth, and you don't have to prioritize it. But they conceded in both Second Crossfire and Grand Crossfire that how the economy is being grown is very important. And this is where we win the debate. On the income inequality argument, we show you that the Trump administration grows the economy by cutting taxes on the wealthy. He did so in his tax bill, and if you continue to prioritize growth, he continues to do so. This is terrible for long-term economic growth and sustainability. First, we tell you that increasing income, in 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 income inequality helps the wealthy out while disenfranchising the poor. Every 1% increase in income inequality increases the poverty rate by 5.2%. But secondly, it's unsustainable in the long term. Every single one of their terms on our case about crowding out, about reducing the debt, has to do with the economy actually growing. Income inequality does the opposite in the long term. They don't even win economic growth. But secondly, on magnitude, it disenfranchises low-income individuals who are the most vulnerable and have the most severe impact. You should always prioritize low-income individuals and affirm for this reason. But with that said, you can vote for us off of our second arguments on monthly interest payments and budget cuts. The debt is not infinite. We tell you that interest rates are increasing because everyone is losing confidence in us. They say that GDP and economic growth solves back for the debt. Trump has been prioritizing economic growth. The ratio has just continued to increase. Their argument is not true in probability. But secondly, we explain to you why his economic growth is unsustainable. But secondly, the economy and GDP growing is not enough to pay off the debt when you're growing with tax cuts because you don't generate enough tax revenue to reduce the debt. That's why the only way to reduce it is to affirm. Uh, we have 36 
get this high debt, because these high debt has led to crowding in, which spurs investment. Next, they've conceded that there are more cuts in the world of the affirmative because we have to scale we have to default on debt with rising interest rates that only economic growth can solve, which they've also conceded. Next, their impact on the recession, they've, re they've dropped that, uh, the debt brings us out of recession in 2008. They've dropped way too much money to win about.